Okay then, so, um, good morning. Right. Um, this week, right, it's, the, the idea is to get loads of theory in, loads of terms and concepts. So this lecture doesn't really have like a narrative arc, right? It's not got a, I could, I could have jumbled it up and done it in more or less any order. It's just, I'm going to give you um, quite a wide range of terms and concepts to help you to refine and develop your understanding of Orientalism. Most of you in the room have some experience of Edward Said's formulation of Orientalism. That's where we'll begin. That's still the main one. Um, and then we'll look at a, uh, just one example of classic Hollywood Orientalism that most of you, I'm sure, will at least know of, if not know intimately. Then we're going to look at what I promised um, last week, which is some of the, um, the theoretical contributions of Chris Goldie Jones. Um, Orientalism as a kind of magic. Then for those of, this will be of particular interest for those of you who like things like um, computer games and so on. Uh, the question of digital Asia, but I think it's also relevant, like, for those of us who've never ever played a computer game, because life's too short for that kind of shit. Um, <laughs> what shall I do today? I'm going to play a computer game on it. That's my judgement. I'm sure it's very stimulating and worthwhile and, you know. Anyway, digital Asia. Then we're going to look at some case studies, and then we're going to draw some conclusions, if there are conclusions, or reiterate some points. Um, so, the place to begin with Orientalism is um, Edward Said's classic formulation. So, Edward Said's book, 1978, Orientalism, Western Conceptions of the Orient. Um, so, Said's argument is that the, like, there, is a pl there is a place, there are places that aren't European, there is a world... It's got different areas, different geographical, linguistic, cultural, religious kind of areas, different nations over time. So this is, these are all quotes from Said. The Orient is not only adjacent to Europe, it's also the place of Europe's greatest and richest and oldest colonies, the source of its civilizations and languages, its cultural contestant, and one of its deepest and most recurring images of the other. In addition, the Orient has helped to define Europe or the West as its contrasting image, idea, personality, experience. Yet none of the Orient is merely imaginative. So, to the extent that there is one thing called Europe, which, you know, is there? Like, Europe's in itself quite big and quite diverse. But still there is an outer side of it, a sense of the non-European world, the historically the non-Christian world, right? very foreign, so that's the Orient, that's the Middle East, that's Africa, North Africa in particular, all the way through to all the different Asias and bits and pieces. And these non-European lands have historically been the other, that helps to define a shared identity, and this is the simple logic of identity that you're all familiar with, like you're all doing, you're all doing Part of your degree, at least, is JOMEC, Journals and Media Cultural Studies. It's part of your identity. You're the same. You have that in common. You might start to define yourself in relation to... You're not scientists. You're not doing other things. You're not from the other university. You're from this university. Like, simple logic of identity. Like, we are this, not that. So you invent the other... Hello. Sorry. So you invent the other. And the other does exist. It really does exist. But you invent them. You invent the scientists. You invent the people from Cardiff Met. You invent the people who are, you know, if you're from Cardiff, you invent the people from Swansea, the people from Bristol. They exist, but then they exist in your head as part of your identity, as part of your difference. So that's the Orient has functioned um, in the tradition, Western history, European history, as the other that we define ourselves against. We do this in lots of different ways. English, French, Welsh, English, Cornish, Devon, you know, Somerset, Wiltshire, you know, you name it. There's a border and you go, them. This village, next village. Us, them. We do it all the time. 
So this is another quote from Said. Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and most of the time the Occident. Ontological means that it, that which you think exists, like what actually exists. And then epistemological is to do with knowledge, the way that you construct the, the knowledge of what exists. So, Said says that people come along and go, well, there's Europe, or the Occident, the West, and then there's the East. And they make a distinction, and that's an act that invents a lot of categories. You could have done that differently. We make a distinction, we invent categories, we invent the things on both sides of the distinction. And you can do that, we can do it with skin colour, you can do it with gender, you can do it with sexuality, you can do it with, with ability, you can do it with class, you can do it with place. You know, you can do all these things, there's us and there's them. We, I don't know, academics, we men, we women, whatever we, whatever it is. Um, so it's not fake, it's just a way of dividing up the world, one that has effects. And that's what Said is interested in, the effects of this European way of chopping up the world, chopping up the conceptual spectrum of the world. And there's a lot, I mean, Said's book is several hundred, hundred pages long. But there's one image that I think, and, and, and uh, Said goes at this quite early. This is uh, from, I haven't written the page number down here, but it's from the early pages of the book Orientalism. And the structure that Said identifies in this image pretty much defines what Said's theory of Orientalism is all about. So this is a quote um, from Said again. So Flaubert's encounter with an Egyptian courtesan produced a widely influential model of the Oriental woman. So what have we got straight away? European man, non-European woman. Okay. And then you can go, ooh, Europe as man, non-Europe as woman, or as feminine, or feminized. She never spoke of herself. She never represented her emotions, presence, or history. These are my, this is my emphasis. He spoke for and represented her. European man gives an account of non-European identity. Who has the power? Who has the representational power there? The European man. And what he says about the other becomes what we know of the other. That's the structure. Who can speak? Who has the capacity? Not the capacity, the ability, the, the privilege to, to represent European man normally. He was foreign, comparatively wealthy, male. And these were historical facts of domination that allowed him not only to possess Kuchuk Hanem physically, but to speak for her and tell his readers in what way she was typically oriental. My argument is that Flaubert's situation of strength in relation to Kuchuk Hanem is not an isolated instance. It fairly stands for the pattern of relative strength between East and West and the discourse about the Orient that it enabled. So in this little, in Edward Said's reading of this historical, literary, artistic kind of um, example, you see the structure that we're dealing with in Orientalism. European man goes exploring conquests, economic, sexual, cultural, everything. Then European man is able to represent and speak as if speaking the truth. That means that the other is not representing themselves, is, is excluded from that um, world of representation. You know, if I give an account of you, you might raise some questions about that. But if you're not even allowed to raise questions about that, you know, then that who's the person in power? Me. So this is a, a problem of representation and a problem of dominance, or an issue of dominance. And Said's argument is, as many of you already know, that the European representation of the Orient, Oriental people, Oriental men, Oriental women, Oriental lands, was one of exoticism and all the rest of it that comes with that, fetishism, fantasy, putting something on a pedestal while also therefore diminishing it. You know, if you kind of fetishize something, you put them on, oh, that's amazing, you, 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 you kind of 
remove it from the status of the ordinary, the everyday, you trivialize it in the, in the sense of exoticizing it. Um, so remember this image. So in a sense, even when we're not dealing with exotic um, females from the European perspective, even you know the, um, the Oriental man, the Oriental men, they're all generalized in the same way, reduced in complexity, simplified, stereotyped. Okay? Stereotype's the word. We'll come back to stereotype lots over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be thinking more explicitly about, about stereotypes um, next week. So, name that film. I can't remember which one it is. Zhang Yimou, House of Flying Daggers? Yeah, that's House of Flying Daggers. Okay. So, then he talks in his more recent preface, so Saeed's book was published and republished and republished, and he wrote um, prefaces to the, to the new version. So this is not 1978 anymore. This is Saeed in the 21st century. One aspect of the electronic postmodern world is that there has been a reinforcement of stereotypes by which the Orient is viewed. Television, the films, and all the media's resources have forced information into more and more standardised moulds. So far as the Orient is concerned, standardisation and cultural stereotyping have intensified the hold of the 19th century academic and imaginative uh, demonology of the mysterious Orient. So, there's more media, there's more holidays, there's more travelling, there's more globalisation of films and of culture and of music and of everything and of art and all the rest of it. Less breathing in. <coughs> and then... But that hasn't somehow made us all enlightened. It hasn't got rid of Orientalism. It's intensified it. There's more media coding, media, stere media stereotypes. The intensification of stereotypes, the intensification of Orientalism. So you get Zhang Yimou, who's a Chinese film director, who's, well, is he self-Orientalizing? Is it all about... It's an intensification of sensitive Chineseness. Not just Westerners producing it, but Chinese filmmakers producing it for a global audience. We'll talk about that. So even though we can more or less travel anywhere, you know, within reason, a lot of more tourist destinations, we can go all over China, we can go all over Japan, we can go to Thailand, we can go to Vietnam, go wherever. Still hasn't eradicated our sense of it as mysterious, the European sense of it as the mysterious. And I mean, reciprocally, you can flip this round you flip this round in lots of ways. The American fetishization of Paris, for example. You know, where is it they always want to go in Friends? In Friends? It's like Paris. So anyway, you romanticize the other place. Um, so. Indiana Jones, anyone? So, this is classic Hollywood Orientalism. Let's have a look at this trailer for this excellent film. The volume's good. The old legend of the Shankar stones. The village of sacred rock was taken. Many stories, Dr. Jones. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. So, all of the Indiana Jones films, you know these films, right? They're on our Christmas. It's, they're, they're just there. 
And I know some of you have done presentations and essays on these on these topics, but they're such a good example. In in the Indiana Jones films, you see the kind of colonial European North American ideology. Europeans are allowed to go to these exotic places and stomp all over them and take their artifacts and fight over their artifacts because they're arguing over whose museums they should be in. And the other is reduced to the mystical, the magical, the treacherous, the quaint, the it's diminished in status. In, in those clips, you've seen multiple turban-wearing or mask-wearing Arab men? Muslims? What are they? What is all that about? Like, so generic, nondescript, imprecise, interchangeable, and of no value characters. Indiana, it matters if Indiana Jones and the few friends that he's got stay alive or die. That's what matters. Not the <coughs> hordes of foreigners who are all interchangeable. So you've got a kind of orientalist structure in which what matters are the Europeans, the, the white Europeans and their friends and their allies. Everyone else and everything else is interchangeable or exotic or strange or, you know, of a different status, and that different status is kind of um, a lesser status. And these are often, these are just locations for the interplay of European characters, or, you know, white, North American and European characters, to have their romantic kind of narrative arcs and so on. Um, white saviour narrative, all the rest of it. So... <coughs> That's, so this is essentially the kind of place that um, Said takes us to, and Said, Said's interest, as, as you, you may be aware, is really in the... I think the thing that mainly motivated Said was the representation of Arabs, Palestinians in particular, in the North American media. That was, that was his thing, because he was Palestinian, and he saw, he, he perceived a massive bias in representation. So Israel is all good and all fine, and Jews all fine. And you but uh, Muslims and Palestinians, th th he saw this kind of bias in America. Whether that exists or not is something we can debate at another time. But that was his thing. That's what motivated him to um, to regard this all as political. But there are other ways and other directions this has been developed. Um, and the next article, well, one of the articles that I asked you to look at was um, was by Chris Gotti Jones um, about magic. Um, I didn't ask you to read this whole book, Conjuring Asia, Magic, Orientalism, and the Making of the Modern World, but it's worth it. It's a really easy read, and it's hello. How are you doing? Um, yeah, you probably have to sit there or something because there's not many places there. Um, so the whole book is about the history of magic. Like, you know, think proper magicians. Like hats and rabbits and abracadabra and like, boom, things vanishing. That, this is the magic, these, these kind of circus acts uh, uh, and, and stage performances. The history of magic is absolutely brilliant. Um, so, so he argues that the Western imagination had been riddled with references to the mystic East and the mystic Orient for centuries. And the fashion for chinoiserie <coughs> in the 18th century, so, so chinoiserie, that's everything Chinese, Ch Chinesey stuff, um, and Japonisme, right, these are, you know, French, it's a French ways of saying this, because saying things in French was also cool at the time. So he didn't just say, I'm into Japanese stuff, like, he'd say, like, oh, I'm interested in Japanese, no. well, and also French, the um, chinoiserie and Japonisme. I should just do the whole lecture in a French accent, shouldn't I? <laughs> in the 19th, so, chinoiserie, Japonisme, fed into the Victorian romanticization of India, as a place of enchantment and wonder. So, the other is mysterious, it's non-European. <coughs> Europe is what? 
philosophy, technology, science, imperialism, military. Like, the West is dominance. What has to be dominated is the rest. The countries that become colonised, countries that are difficult to colonise because they've got harsh landscapes or, you know, whatever. So these are all mysterious places where true magic, true magic, can exist. So when we have the European stage shows of magicians throughout the 18th, and especially the 19th century, um, the kind of semiotic codes of exoticism and magic become the same as, you know, uh, Middle East, Far East, India, Africa. Right? Um, and there are lots of examples of different um, self orientalized or orientalized. So now you, well, not now, but in the past there was a convention, there's the convention of blackface. Which is the is the classic black and white minstrel show where white people right. would would put black makeup on, and that's absolutely verboten nowadays. That's absolute like you'll be cancelled, and the rest of it, right? It's which, it's fair enough. And then there's yellow face, which is the technique of of dressing up as um, Chinese or, or Asian. These are white Europeans dressing up as Chinese or Asian, and then there's all different gradations of of, of this so and so face. Some of it we think is okay. Like, some of it's just acceptable. Like, I don't know, Ben Kingsley's performance of Gandhi was like, okay, right. But then anyone who does it in a parodic manner, <coughs> and you might go to a pantomime, and there'll be people playing Aladdin, you know, playing Aladdin, and then you've got China, and you've got China. Anyway, and it's really problematic. We can talk about all of this. In seminars. But there were characters such as um, this guy, Chong Ling Su, who was actually called William G. Robinson. Okay? So, so uh, go to Jones Wright. A number of magicians became so enwrapped in mystical Orientalism that they presented their entire shows in the guise of an Oriental, dressing up as a fictive Arabian, Chinese, Japanese, or Indian magician believing that this mode of presentation would communicate new <coughs> levels of mystery and wonder to audiences in the West. The most famous performer in this tradition was certainly William Robinson, a.k.a. Chung Ling Su. Now, Chung Ling Su pre pretended like he lived his life in drag, like he lived his life as Chung, because so successful was he. And a really interesting thing occurred. An actual Chinese magician in London said... This guy's a fake. It's, this, this, it's nuts. He's not even Chinese. Right? And they had some kind of a, like a rap battle, but a magician battle. Right? In which the audience decided <coughs> that clearly the most authentic and definitely Chinese person was Chong Ling Su, because he was so hyper. Because the actual Chinese guy was just like a guy who lived in London. But Chong Ling Su was doing all of the stereotypes. All of them. So he came across as more Chinese. Anyway, um, now this is a, a really interesting little aside that I wanted to um, pop into your minds um, about authenticity. And uh, one of the things that um, go to Jones's study of the history of magic is that there's always an invocation of real, true magic in these perform in these performances. There's either the kind of Penn and Teller kind of Darren Brown deconstruction or challenging of that idea. But there's always the implication that there is true magic, like there are true magic people. I think the last real famous one that we might know of was David Blaine. Remember David Blaine? Long time ago for you, but you might have seen repeats and so on. Like he presented himself as magic with his tattoos and his strange behaviour, and his... <coughs> right? Well, and then Darren Brown, and people say, it's not magic, it's psychology. Anyway, anyway. So this quote stuck out for me. Our persistent and intuitive sense of a crisp distinction between real and pretend magic is itself a form of cultural illusion that emerges from centuries of representations of wizards, warlocks, and witches. So if I dress up as a druid, 
or I dress up as a, a witch or a wizard or a magician. You might go, but that's, he's not really that. He's not really that, right? He's not really like an Arabian magician. That kind of implies that there is such a thing as a real Arabian, not musician, magician. There probably are real Arabian magicians. Musicians. God, this is difficult. Anyway, it'd be like if I dressed up as a Martian, and they go, yeah, but he's not really a Martian. It implies that there really are Martians, but, but maybe there aren't, right? So maybe there is no real, authentic magic, but it's like a kind of zombie concept that never dies. Like the true mystical Orient. Is there such a place? It's a fantasy that is generated by our, our, our desires and our fears. I just thought that's really interesting. As soon as we start to go, yeah, but the, the authentic, the authentic magic, the authentic China, the authentic thing. What, does it exist? Or is it just a, a, a fantasy production? Like looking for actual unicorns? Or leprechauns? <laughs> so, we've had, uh, say, one kind of inauthentic, clearly inauthentic self-orientalism or self-orientalization. Um, but there are other kinds. So we tend to think of um, orientalism as, as something bad that Europeans and North Americans do. Um, that we represent the other culture in stereotypical um, manners via our Indiana Joneses and, and so on, or racist news reports and so on. But for a long time, um, it's been a t bit of a two way traffic as well, a bit of a two way street. So Here's another long quotation. Oh, this obviously this presentation is on Learning Central, so you don't need to be take photographs or trying to write down this stuff. Just take notes of things that you want to think about, and check this later. And the lecture is being recorded, so check that later if you want um, <coughs> to try and unjumble my jumble. Um, so this is a long quotation. Don't try and write it down. The, the fin de siècle interest, the end of the century interest in East Asia emerged from the cultural context of chinoiserie, which began in force in the 18th century, and japonisme, which uh, took Europe by storm in the 19th century. So long been fashions in Europe for things East Asian and North Asian and West Asian. Um, after Japan finally opened its doors to foreign trade, um, which we can talk about um, in a different context. These aesthetic movements in Europe and North America reflected a more general public enchantment with the colourful cultures of distant lands and colonies. This is the period of the great world's fairs and international expositions, where nations such as India, China, and even the rapidly industrialising Japan would routinely represent themselves in traditionalist, quasi-mystical ways, deploying performances that emphasise the aesthetic elements of their culture rather than emphasising the tremendous technological or industrial developments. This tendency has come to be known as self-orientalism. So, the, the period of the world's fairs through the 19th century you have, and the 20th century, you have vast demonstrations of the world and culture and industry and society um, in London, in all the in Paris, in all over the place. Um, and what um, Gautu Jones is pointing out here is that the tradition for many of the countries that were regarded as exotic by um, Europeans, they would come and just entirely play up to that. Entirely go, yeah, all right, okay. So we're exotic and interesting and we've got strange cultural practices. All right then, let's go and showcase them. Um, and this, this process has never really stopped. These, these um, countries like India and China have often showcased the things that they know Europeans are most interested in. 
So it's not an entirely one-way street. It's a complex process in which um, I don't know if you think of it in terms of supply and demand, because it is a bit like that. If you think this is our identity, if this is what you want from us, okay, come and buy it then, we'll sell it to you. And also for reasons of cultural diplomacy and cultural distinction, to say this is ours, this is essentially our thing. Um, lots of countries do that, they'll do it with sport, they'll do it with religions, they'll do it with specific traditions. Um, and they'll kind of go, this, no, this is definitely ours. Definitely, definitely ours. So, uh, we, if we just stay with China for a little while. So, China has long done it with Tai Chi. And pandas. Like, seriously, right? Because they're two things that really didn't exist anywhere else. So, the, 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 the pandas are different to the Tai Chi. Um, I, read a, uh, there's a, I read a book recently called Panda Nation and it was just like the, literally every single thing you ever wanted to know about pandas everything like everything from their biology to their diet to uh, everything but to the way that it's been and I didn't know quite what to make of it but one thing that was really interesting was the fact that the panda wasn't an image that say westerners projected onto China it was one that China went we've got the pandas you like pandas? Got to talk to us, right? And the pandas became like cultural diplomatic gifts, like they would gift them to zoos in America or lend them out and all this sort of stuff. The panda became this symbol of China because it was a tool of cultural diplomacy. Um, tai Chi was chosen um, by the Chinese nationalists in the 1940s and the communists um, because it was non-Western. It wasn't a sport. Right? It's kind of got Chinese roots, Taoism, Buddhism. Get rid of the religious bits and the, the communists were entirely fine with that. And all the religious stuff was got rid of that. Get rid of the old... Keep, but it's communal, Tai Chi, you all do it together in parks. Right? So these things that we... Then we go, oh, well, that must be a really sort of... Is that a racist thing for me to think in terms of pandas and Tai Chi? Or is it not? Is it a two-way street of trades in stereotypes? So, so self-orientalism is something to think about. And it also kind of demonstrates the way in which um, orientalism doesn't mean racism. Orientalism shades into racism, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Because you're putting things on different levels. So Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, they go to these exotic, mystical lands. And the people there are not really relevant. They're interesting curiosities. What matters is the battle between the European and North American powers. But self-orientalism. Um, and it's a funny old thing because, so like, if we go back to this guy, if we go back to um, William Robinson, like nowadays, that, that, what is that kind of performance? That we look at him and go, I don't know about that. That's, that's a bit iffy. Um, so, like, I, I had a visiting um, a visiting scholar once came and, and, and gave me a Tai Chi suit, like a proper, authentic, um, traditional Tai Chi suit. Like, it's like, and I've never worn it because, it, to me, it's like fancy dress, like, like really bad. Um, and, and also, I really hate like um, Western white European Tai Chi instructors who wear kung fu clothes. It pisses me right off and call themselves Sifu and all the rest of it. But if, but if a Chinese dude is wearing that stuff, you kind of go, oh, that's authentic. Yay for authentic. I put it on. Uh, what is that? Is it cultural appropriation? What is that? What's going on with that? So we need to think about that. On the one hand, the, if, I, if, if I put on traditional Chinese clothes, I'm the very exemplification of the inauthentic, the false, the pretentious, maybe cultural appropriation. Chinese dude, the very incarnation of authenticity. So what is going on in our thought processes when we make these two different judgments? What are the kind of cultural dynamics in play? It's, not, it's never cut and dry, it's never really straightforward. <laughs>